On this episode of Meat Eater, we turn away from the land and look toward the sea. I'm gonna pull a bounty of seafood, shrimp, crab, fish, and clams from the cold water surrounding my shack in Southeast Alaska. It's rod to table, trap to table, and even glove to table. When it comes to seafood, this is as good as it gets. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. I've said it many times. Fishermen don't necessarily know how to hunt, but most folks who hunt certainly know their way around a rod and reel. It should be no surprise that I'm as addicted to fishing and the spoils of fishing as I am to hunting. So on this show, I set down my rifle in order to collect a few of the most popular specimens of seafood from the waters around my cabin in Southeast Alaska. I'm gonna freeze my catch and bring it down to the lower 48, where I'll bring it back to life with some easy to replicate recipes. Fresh seafood from a hunter-gatherer perspective is almost kind of a luxury because inevitably you're going to go out, you're going to get a big haul, you're going to eat some that night, and you're going to want to bring some home with you. Nowadays, we have the luxury of having a freezer, and it allows you to kind of capture some of that freshness, though it does degrade over time. When I freeze this stuff, I really like to try to consume it within a few months. And I'll be honest with you, the stuff I'm dealing right now is at the outside edge of that time frame. So the things I'm going to be doing here are not tailored so much for brand new, fresh seafood. They're tailored more for things that have been in my freezer, and now I want to make them taste as good as I can, and maybe add a little flavor to them, add a little more cooking to them, and just acknowledge and respect the idea that it's not fresh and perfect. I'm going to be doing four simple preparations. I got butter clams, the meat. I'm going to do fried clams. I have spot prawns, de-headed. I'm gonna peel these and do a grilled skewered shrimp. I have Dungeness crab knuckles. I'm gonna steam these, pick the meat, and do a crab frittata, which is an egg dish. And I have a whole rockfish, gutted, de-gilled, and I'm gonna be putting some gashes in him and doing just simple whole grilled fish. These are spot prawns. I catch these in around 38 fathoms. You know, and a fathom is six feet of water, so they're a very deep, cold water crustacean. Spot prawns are carnivorous, let's say meat eaters. So when I set for them, I bait the traps with low-grade spawned out salmon that's sold as cheap frozen bait. Shrimp spots are acquired through much trial and error, or else a tip from someone who knows. If you hit it right, you can be rewarded with a hefty load of shrimp. But there's a lot of work to be done before you get to find out what you caught. These are really tough to hand pull because they're heavy and they're deep. 250 feet of water. Oh yeah, not bad haul. Get back in there. I mean, these are huge shrimp, you see. Something was reaching in here, eating them. Because look at this. This guy right here. Something got in there and consumed him. Could have been like octopus. We'll get and, and you know reach in and kill shrimp out of there. They're big, heavily armored. They got the spear on them. Go right through your glove into your hand, give you a good infection. But it's a huge shrimp. Spot prawn, spot shrimp. With the catch in the boat, I head back to my cabin to prep these shrimp for travel. As much as people like to boil whole shrimp for freezing it and eating it later, it's best to get rid of the head. If you have nice clean tails, they freeze nice and they don't discolor. Grab the head, they kind of grab it right around where you'd grab the gill plates on it if you were grabbing a fish. You put a thumb in this little hinge, squeeze the heads, a little bit of a twist, pop off, get rid of that, make sure you got a clean face. On this one, you can see something that's important. I got some of this brown stuff. That stuff right there doesn't freeze well, and it starts, it just smells kind of funky, and it dyes everything a strange color. 
So I got a little bit of that on there. I want to rinse these tails with fresh water until that thing is just like translucent, nice, clean, white flesh. Still in their shells and frozen inside a heavy-duty resealable bag, these shrimp will travel to wherever you need them. Peeling is really quite easy. and People struggle when they're peeling shrimp with uh, the tail portion, trying to get it off. It works better to squeeze this thing. I grab it like this and just kind of pinch the base of the tail and then pull the meat out. And you wind up getting all the edible portions out. With these shrimp, I'm going to do shish kebabs. And I like to use two skewers when I'm doing them because it allows you to turn them and manage them a lot better. I used to try to do it on one skewer, where you'd run it like this. But the things are always rolling around, and they're difficult to lift off. They want to stick to the grill. It just makes a mess. So now I do two, and just thread them on, and lay them in nice like that. And leave yourself a little bit of handle down here. Don't crowd the handle too much. The last thing I do to keep the end ones from falling off is just put a piece of lemon on there, because it's hard to get on. It just acts like a stopper. I'll be grilling the shrimp very simply with a little salt and pepper and some garlic butter. I'm gonna take advantage of the hot grill and cook my next dish at the same time, a whole rockfish. Here we have a one and a half pound Alaska rockfish. This is a nice fish because it's so reliable. And when a lot of other fish aren't around, like when the salmon aren't running, halibut might not be around, you could always find rockfish. There's a big rock right here, well, a series of rocks in here. And on this side, they spill off real steep down to you know, a pretty good depth. The rockfish tend to hang out on that cliff face. Big it up, big it up. There we go. Well, these are great eating fish. Um, I like them as much as halibut easily. When you're retaining rockfish now, they don't want you throwing rockfish back. At this depth, it doesn't matter, but in super deep depth, their swim bladder erupts. You know, it gets, it's full. So if you don't handle the fish properly with kind of sophisticated measures, you're gonna, the fish is going to die. So if you're retaining rockfish, they don't want you throwing any back. They don't want you like trying to high grade or select which ones you keep. They're very heavily armed, as are many of the fish down here. Thorn, thorn, thing. OK, to bring fish home, I like to do whole fish. For whole fish, I want them scaled and gutted, because the best time to scale them is now. They got a pretty tough scale, so it's good to have a slightly bigger blade. Something stout. Once he's done like that, we got them scaled. Coming out the cloaca, come all the way up, split that breastplate, and we're gonna come up here and separate the gills. They don't freeze well. Whole gut and fish. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grill this guy whole. And a problem with grilling fish whole is you get the thin parts cooked so fast and the thick parts are still raw. To mitigate that problem, you want to just cut gashes in it, just down to the bone, go about an inch. Use a sharp knife when you're doing this. You don't want to like mash the fish up. You just want nice, clean cuts. On a little bit bigger fish, what I'll do is I'll actually put lemon wedges in there to kind of hold the flesh apart and let the heat get in. But he's all right. I want to do some salt and pepper. Inside and outside. The next thing I'm gonna do after I do my salt and pepper, I'm gonna put some orange and some herbs inside just to kind of dress them up a little bit, make them look pretty. The last thing I'm gonna do right before I grill them is I'm gonna give them a generous brushing of oil. But for now, he's cool, he's ready to go. The key to grilling whole fish is to resist the temptation to mess with it. I'm going to lay it on the grill, and it's going to be stuck there like there was super glue on those wires. It's going to be like, Ugh! and if you try to monkey with it and get it off of the spatula, you're going to tear it all to pieces. you got to let it sit and be patient. 
the grill will tell you this fish is done when you can move it without it sticking to the grates. Let me get my shrimp ready. Got a little brush made up here, just bind a bunch of herbs together. Looks real pretty. What I'm brushing on here is butter mixed up with my shallots and garlic. And I just got the butter till sizzling and kind of very lightly sauteed the shallots and garlic. But the issue with using too much is that stuff's gonna wanna burn when you put it on there. So don't just douse them in it so that it's dripping down into the flames real bad. The fish may need to just sit there, but I turn the shrimp frequently to keep them from burning. And I brush them down after each turn. I'm gonna test my fish. He's free. See how he's moving around? The shrimp are done when they're pinkish all over and firm to the touch. When you slice into one, the flesh should still have a translucent quality. You don't want it looking as white as a cooked chicken breast. The fish is done when the flesh can be easily pulled away from the spine and ribs. Grilled seafood in the snow. This is probably my favorite kind of crab in all the world. It's Dungeness crab. In Southeast Alaska, I catch these crabs in funnel-type crab traps baited with fish parts. And as you set them in bays and coves and stream miles, particularly places to get salmon runs, because the crabs seem to kind of congregate outside those salmon streams and feed on them. I've had good luck using this strategy in this same location in the past, and this time is no different. The trap is literally crackling with Dungeness crabs. To keep these, they gotta be male, and they gotta be six and a half inches. And I'm only allowed three as a non-resident, so I'll pick the three biggest. The way I like to do crabs is two steps. One, I knuckle them, so I take all the, the actual white meat and remove it, and still leaving it in the shell. And then I parboil it, and then I freeze it. So I split them. And we go and grab them. There's a knuckle. And there's a knuckle. Now that's all the meat that just came off right there. Take your thumb and scrape away the gills and the innards. Rinse. You want everything off there but shell and meat. I'm eating fresh crab, I'll cook these knuckles 10 minutes of boiling water. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm just gonna hit them for eight minutes and then pull them out and chill them with water, spraying water on them to cool them off. I then just pack those knuckles into bags and freeze them and then I save them for later. You, you, they'll, they'll keep for a couple months in your freezer. I'm picking the last bit of this Dungeness crab. What I'm gonna make now is sort of a, a frittata, which is kind of like a open-topped omelet. It's not folded, it's an egg dish. And I'm gonna add a lot of other stuff to the frittata. The nice thing about a frittata is that, just like an omelet, you can tailor it to your own taste. For mine, I'm lightly sauteing some garlic, red onion, and bell pepper with some basil, oregano, and a little bit of thyme. Once I can pick up the aroma of all the ingredients, I add them to eight lightly beaten eggs. Then it's time for the crab. I don't want it to be like some cheap buffet where they put a little crab in there to make you feel like you're getting something special. I want it to be crabby. You know, like that should be the defining feature of the dish is the crab. I got some olive oil in this pan. If your stove has a tilt to it and you see all the oil ganged up in, in one side of the pan, like most things in this world are not as level as we'd like them to be. Tip it and get the oil in the middle because it's important that when the egg gets in the pan that it keeps a buffer of oil around. If, if all the oils run off to one side and you put it in, you're gonna have bad news up here on the dry side. I'm gonna tip my oil so the whole pan's coating oil. I'm gonna start putting that stuff in there. And I wanna make sure that that keeps a buffer. And we got a ring of olive oil around the frittata. Now we're gonna cook it very gently. With the heat coming from the bottom, it'll take forever to cook through to the egg in the top center of this dish. And by then, the bottom will be burned. So once the bottom edges have begun to turn golden brown, it's time to slide the dish under a broiler so we're throwing heat at it from above. 
I add some sliced tomato and Parmesan and pop it in. That's a very potent broiler and I'm probably like maybe eight inches from the broiler. Depending on how hot your broiler is, you'd adjust it. I like to keep an eye on this so I don't overcook it. Pull it out just when the top is starting to bubble and brown. And crab frittata. Okay, the last step, the last thing I'm gonna do for this meal is I'm gonna fry clam strips. Now these clams are perfect for chowder frying a variety of things. In this area, the best way to dig butter clams is to wait for a low tide to expose their beds. You can find them simply by looking for the jets of water that they expel. I found this particular clam bed while passing through here in my canoe on the way to hunt black bears. Yeah, what a find, man. That's a good bed right there. <laughs> Sweet. I'm trying to remember where this is. It's a mother load of butter clams. Tide's gonna wash us out. I'm just going for the patties now. And remember, before consuming any kind of bivalve, make sure to check for red tide reports. Red tide is an algal bloom that can produce toxins that are absorbed and concentrated by clams and other filter feeders. Eating those shellfish can bring on paralytic shellfish poisoning, which can prove fatal. You have to be careful. Okay, so I'm gonna take the clam and just come in like this to shuck them. Let's take a knife, cut, 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 open them up. And you can use any number of things. The spoon works good. Separate the meat there. And then what you want to get rid of on these is that little black tip on the end of the siphon, because that can concentrate PSP, or paralytic shellfish poisoning. That stuff concentrates in the black tip. This dark stuff, just stomach contents. Squeeze that stuff out. That'll go into our freezer bag. It's kind of hard to mess up fried clams, but this is a good way to do them. Then I'm going to make a dry batter here, equal parts flour fine ground cornmeal. For added color, I'm gonna do some paprika, and some cayenne. Paprika is nice, I always like this for fried fish, any kind of breading for fried fish. And we got cayenne, I don't wanna do too much, but quite a bit. Right here I have whipping cream. You can use anything, you can use milk, you could probably use beat up egg, pull it up. It's like little goobers, lay them in there. They pull them out. I'm gonna start filling my basket up. See all that thing that clam lets off a lot of water? That's all that bubble, all that. When you fry something, you drop it in and it goes nuts, bubbling, that's liquid. And we're getting to a point now where the liquid's getting cooked out because the bubbles are tapering off. So, you know, the water's coming up, evaporating off the surface. My fryer temp is set to 356 degrees Fahrenheit and it won't take long for these to finish. As soon as the bubbling drops off dramatically, take them out of the fryer. I like to serve mine up in the classic fashion, lemon wedges and cocktail sauce. The spread looks pretty good. Grilled whole rockfish, shrimp kebabs, fried clams, and crab frittata. That's perfect because when you bite it, your mouth doesn't say eggs, it just says crab. Like that's the first thing that hits you and that's the way I like it to be, like to really highlight the crab. And it's such a nice way to spread out your crab. Like, I mean, it makes a little pile like this, make a whole plate like that full of like crabby goodness. On the clam, your mouth says, hell yeah, deep fry. But it still says clam. It's not so much you don't know what's in there. You know you got clam. Rockfish is an excellent fish. It's smoky from the hardwood. Still very moist, very mild. If someone says they don't like fish, this is a good fish to start them on, a good preparation for it. 
approachable, firm, flaky, white flesh fish. A little bit of salt, a little pepper, but just very clean and simple. And finally, you got spot prawns or spot shrimp. These are a favorite of mine because they're such a meaty shrimp. There's just tons of substance to it, you know. It's like if you could somehow take the flavor of shrimp and the substance of chicken and combine them in a pleasant way, that's what you got right here. This is an award-winning seafood plate right here. It's an indisputable fact that frozen seafood is not as good as fresh. It will just never match the purity and simplicity of something that's coming from straight out of the water. But if you want to preserve a big haul and spread out the good times, freezing becomes a necessity. As long as you put a little bit of extra thought and care into how you preserve and prepare it, you can still taste and remember the sea, even if you're hundreds of miles and months away from the shore.